Well, welcome everyone. I'm Anna Libby. I'm the Community Education Director here at MAFCA. So glad you could all be here this evening. We, the past several years in the summer, have gone on some tours of different gardens and homesteads throughout Maine. And it's a great chance to be together and learn some new tips and just see some beautiful spaces we have here in Maine. Um, this year, we have been moving some of that programming online and have been so glad to have some folks show us around their gardens here on Zoom. And very excited tonight to have our friends from Deer Isle Hostel, Annalie and Dennis, here to show us some beautiful pictures of their gardens and their produce and talk to us a little bit about food storage, something that might be on many of our minds as we wrap up our work in the garden, hopefully putting away lots of delicious things for the winter. So I will turn it over to you, Emily and Dennis, to show us around. Thank you again for being here. Thank you so much, Anna, and thanks everyone for attending. We've had the hostel closed this summer for reasons you all know. So we haven't seen many people, uh, but normally we have three to 400 guests in the summer. Uh, and then we give public tours on Saturday mornings. So. Okay, I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna put us on full screen like that. Okay. All right, so, so one of the major reasons we opened the hostel was to share the experience of being homesteaders uh, with other people, whether they um, do it or not, mostly they don't. But it's still encouraging to us that people come, and it's also encouraging that you're out there tonight. And we're really grateful for Mafka and Anna for hosting this. So I'll tell you a little bit uh, about the progression of the hostel and the homestead, and we'll move along to how we store the food, which is, will be mostly the garden vegetables, which we have for year round use. So this first photo is um, some of our garden produce and that's the hostel building uh, in behind there. Uh, so tonight we're gonna uh, show pictures and tell you about storing the produce for the first 40 minutes or so. And we'll have the last 20 minutes or so for questions. At the end, we'll have our contact information, so feel free to contact us, us with your interesting questions. Sometimes they make us think, and that's good. Um, but since there's a lot to cover, we'll go ahead and uh, I'll go on to the next picture, which is our we original house. This, this it is not. Yeah, here we go. This is our um, original house that was on the property when we got it. It started out as a little 20 by 12 cabin. And uh, so I had this, bought this place about 20 years ago. And we still live in this house in the winter time. So this is a house where the food is actually stored. There's a little root cellar under it. Um, there's a cold room on the north side. We keep things in the loft and we keep things on the, what would be the left side of this in the mud room as well. Here's what the hostel house looked like um, about 2012. Uh, no, 12 years ago. This is about the time Anna Lee came and this is what the place looked like. You'll see that both our building and gardening styles are based on hand tools and local materials mainly. There's that building completed probably about five years ago. You see some of our favorite storage crops in the foreground, the cabbages and carrots and garlics. We'll go to those in a bit. You can also see what we mulch with here, which is seaweed and partly decomposed leaves. Here's 
here's that same garden on day one. Um, we've cut the trees down about six years earlier and now we're just digging up the roots. This first part was where all the lumber had been stacked when we built the building. And I think this was the next year, there's Anna Lee out there expanding the garden for the first time. And we did that for several years. You see a lot of brush and stuff in the background. This garden came right out of the forest. It had never been cleared other than clear cutting. Um, and we decided, uh-oh. <laughs> we decided not to burn any of the brush, but rather most of it got stacked further away and rotted down. Um, Sorry, that was our phone ringing. Here is that garden and how it looks today. It's pretty big. And let's see, most of the food we grow is storage crops and we do eat all of it. I think that's the biggest question we get is, do you, do you sell this? And we say, no, we eat it all. Most years you could come to the hostel. Hopefully we'll reopen for next summer. We really miss it. And I have a few shots of some of the rooms. This was the dorm that may never exist again, but it could be good for a small family. This was Bruce High screened in on the top half. That's always nice for a couple that's tucked up in the edge of the woods and kind of looks the farm when you look out through it. And this is our latest hut, also tucked up in the woods, two beds, a little more enclosed. Sometimes people disappear in this room and we don't see them for days. And I'll give Emily to you. All right. Well, I'm going to let your eyes rest in this pretty picture for a few minutes while I tell you some of the reasons why we store food um, and of course for many when they think about self-sufficiency a self-reliant food supply is kind of one of the main points or a key thing to do and for us the reasons we do this are so many I could really do a special talk only about why we store food um but what it comes down to for us is simply that we really value high quality uh, fresh food and an abundance of such but like many people in rural areas uh, our access to that food uh, is very limited unless we're willing to drive far to buy it and since we work at home we can't just stop at the store um because we are like that so it would require almost always a special trip to get it there's a couple of grocery stores here on the island uh but to get to a place where we could buy any anything but the basics in terms of produce um it's about a 50 mile round trip and even without those factors, if we had better access, our household finances are just not set up um, to pay for that sort of food. Um, we just simply rather not have jobs that would earn that sort of money. And uh, let's see if I can I'll give you something else to look at. There has really, it's really been sort of two parallel tracks uh, since 2008 when I came here and we really started to go in serious around here. Uh, it's been both about expanding the garden and learning the skills and how to grow the food, but also to learn how to store it and set up the sort of infrastructure needed. Um, there will be photos down the slide here about uh, the boxes we use and a root cellar and things like that. 
and it it just comes natural once we have you know we, we hit a certain point in growing a, a certain volume of food and we just kind of had to learn how to store it as well um and knowing how to put all this food up is a great way to utilize a lot of the hard-earned produce in the garden or rather to utilize the food to max um, at times and everyone that has a garden knows that there are times when zucchinis for example are just about to take over your kitchen um, and the cabbages you know they all come at once and all of them grows to soccer ball sizes and knowing what to do with that produce um, you know you work so hard for it so you if you know what to do to store it then you can eat it i mean through the whole winter really or even longer instead of just putting it all on the compost pile um it's also usually our answer to you know people ask us if we have a greenhouse or why we don't have a greenhouse because we're not and one of the answers we give is always that we still eat say a fresh salad every day through the whole winter because we know how to store our cabbage um you know that's like one of our favorite lines that our favorite lettuce is cabbage um and with that it saves us from having to have a greenhouse and the energy that would go into that Oh, there's Dennis. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, that's a funny photo. I'm gonna get back to that. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to focus on what I'm saying. So storing food for the winter really starts already in the spring with the garden planning. So different varieties of the same crop will of course store differently. So back to that photo, sweeter onions, for example, like these ones, they're Alicia Cray they don't store very long this you know we get to like say almost christmas but we could grow a, we i plant the garden so we grow a few of those compared to how many copras we grow which is an excellent storage variety onion and those onions we will eat late into next summer there's really over the years there's been a lot of crops or more and more crops that tends to overlap um, that we can eat our stored carrots almost all the way till we get new carrots uh, same thing with uh, squash for example we plant fewer summer squash and devote a lot of space for the winter squash that we can also enjoy late into next summer Oh, there's a beautiful savoy cabbage and this is a root salad that Dennis is going to tell us some more about. Hey, this is a shot of our root cellar. This is uh, in the shallow basement that's under our little camp. This is uh, what they call a four foot basement. Don't ever do this intentionally, but we have been managing with that and been building another root cellar. But you see, we have made these boxes which are good for stacking both the produce and mason jars and you also see off to the side there the gallon jars which are kraut and what you don't see is that this little little cellar has two windows and there's a temperature sender in it and a little thermometer um, up in our kitchen above it and we open and close the windows to keep the temperature within the correct range, somewhere between 32 and 42. And of course, towards the end of the season and sometimes in the beginning, we lose that advantage uh, and get a little warmer, but through the winter, we don't have too much trouble. It doesn't cool off very quickly unless, there's a very, unless it's very blowy and there's a storm coming in. Otherwise, it takes days to dip down. Uh, the other thing you don't see in this picture is you gotta have a few mouse traps in your root cellar. We've had people with much tighter root cellars than ours say you still have to have them. Um, and 
we would like to point out that the stacks of boxes, while they're not really rodent proof, they do offer a certain degree of rodent resistance. So one of the major ways we store vegetables is in a box with damp shavings. Uh, with this method, we saw, store carrots, celeriac, beets, and rutabagas. And we basically pack the stuff in the shavings after grading it. You know, we'll have a top grade that we expect to keep longer, and things that don't look as good will eat sooner. But uh, it does pretty good in the shavings in our cellar, and we rewater them usually once towards the end of March. Um, here's a picture of Annalie making boxes. It looks like a lot, but really we have well over a hundred boxes in circulation and it almost always seems like we need a few more. Uh, you see she's making some special smaller boxes right now. So custom sized boxes is um, what we do a lot of now. Those ones are smaller because you can imagine those great big boxes filled with mason jars are really unwieldy. Most of our boxes are this size. Uh, these are the same as the old blueberry boxes were, pretty much. And uh, one of the things that we find critical is the nails. When we make these, we use um, inch and a half box nails. I think those are five penny nails. And we use three nails on each board and that just makes the boxes much more durable over time. See also the handles cut um, and that's done on a table saw with a dado blade after the box is made so you have something to hold on to. And that's a little dangerous but I'll leave you to it if you like. Uh, we made big boxes for cabbages. We were storing them with the roots on and in sawdust. Now these are two things we don't do anymore. Um, now we cut the roots off and we found the sawdust worked well, but it made a mess in the kitchen all the time. So we moved to the shavings. And then some crops we just um, put in the boxes. Like when we dig potatoes, we pretty much just grate them out in the field, take the boxes into the cellar and don't take them back out of the box until we're taking them. Here's a Chinese cabbage. I just hung one, took a picture of it to show you. It's hanging by a string off a nail, as you see, and wrapped in paper. Uh, the purpose of the paper is that it absorbs moisture from the cabbage and makes it so it doesn't mold. Uh, we don't wrap the, we do hang the, the um, I want to call them European cabbages, regular cabbages. We do hang them this way too. We leave the root on when we do that, but whether it's Chinese cabbage, or European cabbage, we wash all the worms out of the roots and we take off the leaves until there's no more slugs, earthworms, or cabbage worms, because those will, of course, feast on the produce if we don't. Here we're rolling up leeks, which is uh, for the same reason we use paper on the Chinese cabbages, it helps to dry them out in the circumstances we keep them in and therefore not mold. Um, so we keep the leeks and the onions and also the garlic in our mudroom. And that room is cool and dry as opposed to the cellar, which is moist. Um, and we get excellent results with the, the leeks and the onions. Uh, but in our case, we don't get 
really perfect results with the garlic, but we get adequate results in that space. And that, that space can freeze a little bit, and it does, um, but those things take it. And then up in our loft, which is the warmest and driest place in the house, we keep the squash. And let's see, as it usually goes, we eat the delicatas first, and then the buttercups we'll eat through late winter. And oh, we'll eat the butter nuts until well into July. And then we have spaghetti squash until the squash comes in. And one more thing in the root cellar, and that is we keep eggs down there now. Um, we've only done this once, but it was very successful. These eggs are in lime. So it's hydrated lime or Mason's lime from the hardware store. And I mix it up in a gallon jar. Like I take a handful and mix it in a gallon jar. So it's kind of the consistency or color of milk. And then it's poured over the eggs. This is probably a three gallon crock with about 100 eggs in it. And those will keep through winter and we experimented and kept them through winter and then through summer and they still tasted just as fresh as could be. Uh, the other thing I'll say about that is that the eggs go in clean but unwashed. And now back to Anna Lee. All right, so I'm gonna tell you about fermentation. Uh, that is probably in terms of volume, the second biggest way we store our food. And of course, most people think of fermented food, first of all, is sauerkraut. And uh, most people that make sauerkraut make it in smaller batches and eat it pretty much right away. Uh, but for us, fermentation is kind of the ultimate self-reliant and low energy way of storing food. Uh, it requires no cooking, uh, no electricity, and equipment needed are things that pretty much everyone has at home uh, like the like glass jars normal glass jars with metal lids uh, you can reuse your old peanut butter jar or jam jar or whatever you got um, and the only addition to the produce that is needed is salt oh i should also say here one thing that i forgot to mention earlier that learning how to store food it's a great thing to do even if you don't have a big garden because a lot of produce can be bought in bulk very uh, cheaply or affordable uh, this time of the year. Uh, there's a lot of farms in our area that sells, uh, say, things like root crops, carrots, potatoes, uh, and even cabbage for uh, next to nothing and if you know how to store it you can save a lot of money by buying um, this sort of produce in bulk and just storing them. Uh, and that's why I thought about it now thinking of the cabbage because cabbage is usually very affordable this time of the year too and this is a great thing to do with cabbage. Um, and knowing how to ferment food enables me to use produce or store produce that wouldn't store well in our cellar, like cracked heads of cabbage, for example, or carrots that doesn't make the cut as a storage carrots because the voles ate on them or they got some worms in them or something like that. Also produce like you see here to the right of this photo, the jar with the cauliflower, uh, produce that is very hard to keep in any other way uh, than say in a freezer. Um, things like the cauliflower, but also I fermented both corn and garlic scapes, for example. And most of my ferments I do in early fall, uh, say right around now. Uh, but in late winter or early spring, we uh, take the time to do a sort of inventory of our cellar to see what we have a surplus of, um, you know, like how much more carrots we can feasibly eat than rutabagas we usually have too many of. And I spend like 
a bad wet winter weather day and turn all that into trout as well. And I suddenly have extended the storage life uh, incredibly by doing that. So most of the fermented goods that we do is sauerkraut. Uh, we probably make at least 40 gallons a year. I know it sounds crazy, but uh, it's like a three meal a day staple for us. Mm, any glass jar will do. As I mentioned, uh, these big gallon jars that you see, we get from a restaurant down the road. Uh, the most important thing if you use um, reuse glass jars with metal lids is that the lid needs to not have any rust on them. Uh, we tend to not reuse the lids because if they get rust, um, it can leak in air into your batch and that will ruin it. You also see that we have this glass top mason jars with the rubber gasket, which are really good to use as um, jars for fermentation, but uh, they tend to be harder and harder to com come by. Mm. So I'm gonna tell you in very brief how I make uh, this sort of fermented produce. Um, that's once again, it's something that I could have a special talk on. You could send me any questions once again to our email. You can ask them if there's time after our talk is done, or you can just beg Anna and that uh, we can have a special presentation on sauerkraut making and other night. So to make sauerkraut, I shred the cabbage and I add five tablespoons of salt per eight pounds of produce. And of course, if I make smaller batches, I just break it down into that. And I pack it tightly in the jars. So the salt will pull water from the produce and that will make the brine. And the brine is essentially what's going to keep the produce from being spoiled. But then there's the vegetables that I don't want to crush, like the cauliflower. So I put the produce in a clean cork jar and I add whatever seasoning I want, you know, whatever my whatever spices my hand is kind of reaching for on the shelf. And then I fill it with water and I add the appropriate amount of salt. Salsa can also be made in this way, which is uh, pretty exciting to a lot of people. That's some more unusual fermented uh, goods. So you make your favorite salsa recipe, however you roll with it, put it in a jar, add the salt, and that's all. Because the tomato salsa is in effect already its own brine. Like you need the liquid to come there some way, whether you have the salt pull it out of the cabbage, add the water to the cauliflower, or the liquid is already in there with the tomatoes. Okay, that was like the crash course on fermentation. So I'm gonna change the slide and talk some about dried food. Uh, we dry both fruit, different veggies and herbs by the gallon. Mm. Something that is well dried and stored in the right way is very shelf stable. And once again, the process doesn't require almost anything for special equipment or really nothing for special equipment. Um, a lot of people uh, choose to go down the road of using an electric dehydrator, uh, which if you have either a wood stove or an appropriate space, like say an attic or a loft of any sort, it will do perfectly fine. Uh, it also has to have a good airflow. Um, so, because that is really crucial, both the heat and dryness of the space and the airflow is really crucial um, to how well you will be able to dry something. Nothing should be exposed to direct sunlight. So I used the third floor attic in the hostel building through the summer. 
and we have a bunch of you know stacks and mattresses or lumber or whatever you, we have up there and we cover it with this you see this pinkish background it's a paper and I just spread everything out in that paper. And then I play this sort of memory game all summer long, trying to remember to close the windows before it's gonna rain, so to keep the humidity out, and then run back up and open them again uh, once the weather dries up. In the winter, or in the fall, also we move back to our little house that you saw on the one of the first slides where we have a wood stove and I have a rack over the wood stove and I just use the window screens uh, to spread things out on. Through the summer I dry mostly flowers for tea. Um, as you see here it's chamomile and calendula and also things like rose petals and linden and tulsi and on and on it goes. I dry some culinary herbs like sage and bay leaves and I've also taken to dry leafy greens like turnip tops that otherwise would be put in the compost and even celery tops and um, I use them as seasoning for any batch of rice or soup stock or things like that. So we grow a lot of shiitake mushrooms and that is one thing that is pretty much like all or nothing. They come in flushes and uh, there's no way we could eat them all right away. So I cut them up really thinly and I spread them out either on the third floor on the paper or just on, on window screens and put them up in my dry space. And also zucchini, as we all know, come all at once. So I came up with this idea to use a cheese slicer, like this one. They're not very common in this country, but I use a cheese slicer and I slice them up and uh, I spread them out like that on the paper. Or you can use your screens or whatever you have and I dry them and they do kind of come a, kind of leathery and some people that I have told about this they come back to me and say well they're kind of like leather now what am I gonna do well then you toast them in a skillet and voila you have the most fantastic chips you can eat as an appetizer while you cook I do that all winter long it's amazing and another thing that I dry in the fall is apples. I do not have a picture of that right now, maybe because it's such a poor apple year. Any variety of apple will do. For those of you who are familiar with Wolf River, that is my favorite. They're really big. They won't keep fresh for more than a few weeks, so no point trying. And I just cut them thin enough put them on those racks over the wood stove once we move back down to a little house and I make them by the gallon and I can I mean I they're stored for years if you store them in a, in the right place okay so Dennis back to you oh we're done oh wow that was fast <laughs> Okay, well, can we see everybody? So, so yeah, now. let's see. Now we want to look at all of you. Hey, hey, everyone. So now we're back on the screen. And maybe Anna, you have gotten some questions, and maybe someone want to unmute themselves, or I let you uh, take it from here. Yes, thank you for showing us um, your beautiful spot and all that gorgeous food you're storing away for the winter everything looks so beautiful um and everyone with us yeah feel free to add your questions to the chat or if you want to unmute and ask it aloud then that is wonderful too um i i'll get us started i had a couple questions for you which you might not know the answer to this but one thing i wondered you said you made about 40 gallons of sauerkraut. And I wondered if you knew about how many pounds or bushels, however you guys measure, of produce you 
grow in a year? You know, every year when I carry all my baskets of produce from the garden and into the house, I wonder myself. And I always think like, oh, it would be great if we had one of those like big scales that I could just like dump this in and take note, but we actually don't. But, you know, it's, um, I, I can't even make a guess. Anyone could make the guess, but it is a lot. It looks like a huge amount out of your garden. Um, and you might have mentioned this. I might have just missed it. How big of a garden plot is it that you're growing on? So the one that you see in front of this building is about 70 by 100. No, the, maybe I'm getting it wrong. We usually yeah. say, we usually talk about it at eight, as 8,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And um, one question that we do get often is if this space, um, maybe people put it more like, is this the amount of space that is required to grow enough food for two people? Uh, you know, people that are interested in starting out gardening with the intent of growing food for the whole year. Now, of course, that is impossible for me to answer because there's so many factors to how much food you can grow in any given area. Uh, first of all, we uh, also grow a lot of food that when we run the hostel, we do these communal dinners and we tend to pitch a lot of produce into those dinners. Uh, and if you have uh, even like a 50 square foot garden, you can grow 50 pounds of food or 150 pounds of food from the same space, depending on what you grow, how fertile your soil is, what kind of sunlight you have, water, I mean, all those sort of factors. Um, and when, you know, now when we have this big space, we can kind of splurge on what we want to grow. But in general, if one is interested in storing and growing and storing food as like a money saving measure, usually as the saying goes, or maybe it's our saying, but uh, calories are cheap and nutrients are expensive. So to grow food as like a, in a you know, financial way or for your economics, it's very cheap to buy potatoes, but very expensive to buy, say, kale and tomatoes and those things. So that is worth considering uh, also when planning the garden. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, you can save a lot of space if you don't eat as much as I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I also want to point out on that note that we eat, you know, most for most people, produce is sort of like a side thing in their meal. Uh, while for us, it's really like the main thing, you know, instead of cooking rice that we would have to buy, we can, you know, base the meal on, on squash or the potatoes that we've grown or so the rutabagas and things like that. So that is also a big factor in how much produce it takes to feed two people through a whole year. I think that's some great perspective. We have some questions here. Um, one, I, this is related to what you're just saying and what you might choose to grow and store. Um, Barbara is wondering if you grow dry beans um, at your place since they're a good storage crop and a good source of main yes. beans. I am so glad someone asked. I spent the whole day threshing beans. <laughs> uh, I have grown dried beans for the last maybe three or four years or so. The reason why we didn't grow it before because we were always of the opinion of like, well, beans are pretty much like the cheapest thing we can buy. We are part of a buying club, so we buy them like really affordably to, through UNFI 
uh, in 25 or 50 pound bags. But then we also found ourselves with like, well, now we have this big garden, maybe we can like at least put a few rows aside for drying beans. And I am here to tell you that a bean grown in your own garden, you might think that just a bean is a bean, right? But a bean that is grown in your own garden, it's very different from a bean that you buy in a 25 pound bag. So we have uh, tried out different varieties for a number of years and kind of like graded out and every year we replant a few of them and then try a few new varieties. Um, and um, I mean, it once again, if you have a small garden financially, it doesn't make sense to grow drying beans. But if you have the space, it is really fun to grow bees. And of course, they will store for just about ever if they're stored in the right way. Do you, we have a bunch of other questions, but do you have a favorite dry bean that you've been growing and storing? Definitely. It's the cranberry pole bean. Oh, wait, I'm going to show some. <laughs> they're a really big and fat. What's that? a beautiful one yeah it looks good and it's also it also tastes like they already put the molasses and butter in it <laughs> and they're big i don't know if you can see it but they're like wait where is the camera they're there like that they, they really there's a reason oh wait my fingers there's a reason they're called cranberry beans uh and petco carries them and uh even if you can just grow enough for like one meal, I mean, a meal for like your anniversary or your birthday or something, because they are really amazing. Thank you for the recommendation. So a question um, about if you bake, she says, when her husband thinks of zucchini, he thinks about zucchini muffins. You doing much baking? Yes. <laughs> We also think about zucchini muffins often, but we never make them. <laughs> Maybe that's why we think about them so often. Uh, we, no, we're not, uh, we're not big on eating any baked goods in general. And uh, if someone made them for us, we would eat them, but there's nothing that we're kind of into. We have a question about fermenting. Someone's wondering what kind of salt you use for your ferments, fermentations. You know, I just use like normal pickling and Morton's pickling and canning salt. Uh, it's like the probably the cheapest thing they have on the shelf. Uh, if you start to read about books about fermentation or Google and fermentation, they can write whole chapters on just what kind of salt to use. But it works beautifully. There's no need to make that a complicated issue. Well, what a good transition. Our next question was about if you have any books you recommend um, related to food storage or anything else about homesteading. Any books you... Oh, wait, wait, I'm going to see if I have my... Here. Hang on. Entertain them. <laughs> of course, you can't really beat any of Sandor Katz's books. They've been very influential here to us. And uh, he was here one time and he said something that really surprised me. He said, I've been touring around for over a decade talking about fermentation and you guys are like the only people that do this to keep stuff through the winter that I've met. And we thought that was the whole point. So we recommend definitely his books. Annalise come with some others. Okay. So I have borrowed, I have lent my fermentation books to my neighbor. But yes, Sandra Katz books are amazing. I did pull out my three other favorite homesteading books. This, oh, you see it kind of backwards. But it's Root Cellaring by uh, Mike and Nancy Bubel. This is kind of the Bible on root cellaring, if anyone is interested in that. Then, this is not about storing produce, but in terms of homesteading, the handbook. This is an absolute must read for anyone 
that is interested not just in composting toilets, but in environmental issues, water preservations, uh, climate change. I mean, this is, uh, this covers so much. And then of course, I mean, now maybe someone is gonna like laugh and shrug their heads, but this little thing, A Homesteader Seer on Deer Isle, which is a book that I published in 2014, uh, it's actually carried by a lot of libraries in Maine these days. And if you're interested to buy it, you can reach out to me, find a neighbor or someone that has it and read it. It also covers food storage, for example, like the same photos are in there. Okay. Thank you for the great recommendations. Some good time of year to settle in with a good book get inspired for next year let's see we have a couple questions about um your beautiful gardens one person is wondering about some big garden pests do you have woodchucks or other um mammals and animals that you have to deal with and before you answer that, I'll just make a side note that someone else is saying in the chat that they have a copy of your book and have used it as a resource at their place in Florida. So there's a recommendation from a fellow <laughs> attendee here. <laughs> we have terrible problems with everything but woodchucks. Um, <laughs> we have so many voles and mice. Uh, we really need a cat now, I'd say. but. Um, we have had increasing pest pressure of all kinds for years but our biggest problem is that we've preserved all the oak trees around and you can see them beside the hostel but there's 20 great big oak trees or so here in the yard that's set off a cascade of the mouse population exploding the squirrel two kinds of squirrels exploding uh, it's kind of wet around the bottom edges of the garden, so that makes the voles really happy. Uh, so those problems are ones we're dealing with gradually. We've been um, making, uh, we've been putting uh, wide boards in the ground around some of our uh, storage crops, the celeriac and rutabagas has it right now, where we sort of make a wall to keep the voles out. Uh, late in the season we do this or some sometimes midway as they figure it out in a way uh, so yeah we have big challenges we have a lot of traps and for a vegetarian i kill a lot of animals we uh, we should also mention that we use a trap called the better rodent trap that is set off with just a spring it doesn't have like the hook so when something is caught in it, you don't actually have to touch the mice or anything like that. You just kind of flick that leverage and toss it away. And when we put the traps in the garden, we have made little boxes. It's kind of big as like a shoe box. And we put the traps in and the box has a lid and two entrances, one on each uh, of the short end of the box. And this is to prevent the songbirds from getting caught in the trap. Um, so that has worked out really well for us. And it's really worth, um, it's worth doing the rounds and putting traps in your garden if you have rodent problems. And it's also worth uh, making a sort of uh, protection so the songbirds doesn't, don't get in there. That's a good tip and um i'll just add for folks who are having challenges um with mammal pests in the garden um caleb who works with me at mofka he's our organic crop specialist did a little article in the summer mof and g about that topic so he had some tips there too if you want to look into that um, and maybe you can see in the photo, I should say also that we have a six foot fence around our garden. Um, I mean, this is not called Deer Isle for nothing, but pretty much anyone in Maine has deer right around their place. 
and there is yes i mean i meet people every year who try to start a garden and they don't take the time to build a fence there's no point planting a garden if you don't keep the deer out at least not in our area it's a total waste of time uh, and we have found that with this six foot fence like we put a lot of time and effort into building it but it works beautifully and once we had made it i mean some of those posts and the fence itself has been there for 12 years now and they still do a good job keeping the deer out fencing is so helpful in the garden well, let's see. I think you answer part of this question. You mentioned you're a vegetarian, but someone's wondering if you have any animals on your homestead um, and if you fish at all. Do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, we have chickens. Um, we keep about a dozen, sometimes 20. And uh, you saw how we keep the eggs. And we used to keep pigs. That was all right but we were trying to feed them from our own resources and that was too much uh too much work for us and here we are on dri also i did say i was i don't know how it slipped out i said i was a vegetarian i meant i'm mostly a vegetarian because <laughs> we have plenty of deer so we sort of wore ourselves out keeping and slaughtering pigs and then we didn't want to shoot deer we were just worn out so we were like this is just not right let's just shoot get this over with and that's been a really great thing the deer population has continued to go up and up so it it's just good for nature and for our garden and everything to get rid of a few here and there so that's um some of the things and uh we don't fish we have a young man in the neighborhood that we sometimes paid to get the fish for us. He's great. And we're here uh, near one of the best clam flats around. So we go for uh, the steamers. And also one of our most favorite foods of all is the great big hen clams that we get down here that taste so good. Nice. Well, let's see, I see a question here and um, I don't know if you have any advice about this. I know we've been doing a series of gardening Q and A's this summer, and I feel like this was a common a common problem for many gardeners this summer, which was that um, the brassicas had a lot of bug pests this summer. Any any tips on how you guys deal with that? Well, generally, we tell people that if you're not willing. I mean, there's two, usually when people talk about brassica and pests, it's the cabbage worm um, and the cabbage moth. Um, and there are two basic ways to deal with this. You either use row covers or you spray with BT. And BT is an organically approved spray. Uh, you can buy it, I mean, pretty much anywhere. Any garden store will have that. So row covers comes with pros and cons. Uh, people that really don't want to spray for anything, of course, opt for the row cover. A lot of people that use the row cover say it still doesn't, can, it doesn't seal, so it, it's not bulletproof. And it tends to flop off. It tends to like fall in weird places. It requires sort of like a lot of maintenance. And we just don't like to use any sort of plasticky material in our garden. So we go for the spraying. Uh, we didn't have like a high pressure on the brassica this year. So say we do like a couple of sprayings throughout the season and that really takes care of it. Wonderful. Thank you. So it is getting close to eight here, but we had a couple more um, questions about your garden. One is, what is your secret with keeping your weeds down? We see these beautiful weed-free beds here in these photographs. And the other one is, how do you water your garden? What's your secret for that? <laughs> Sure. So, the, um, do you want to talk about the weeds? I should have. Okay. So, the really the key to keeping the weeds down. I mean, other than like 
a good photographer that can like Photoshop your photos after taking them is to mulch. Mulching is really the key and that ties in with both the watering and the weed pressure. We are fortunate enough to live on the coast and only two miles from a place where seaweed is abundant and free and easy to get. So we mulch with seaweed. Now I understand that we are in a very kind of privileged little tier of gardeners that have that but whatever you can find like get your hands on something that you can mold your garden with uh, you know some things are going to have consequences like if you choose to go down the road of straw and grass cuttings you may find that the voles and the mice are just going to absolutely thank you for giving them a nice home to be in but you need to mulch with something uh, both for the weed pressure and also for the watering. Um, do you want to talk about the watering again? Yeah, we pretty much don't water. Um, this is partly because the property sits in the bottom of a kind of a stone bowl. You don't see it well at all in this picture, but the land is sloping um, downhill from at least two sides. And um, we've had to ditch around the garden very well to have it be dry enough. So this works out for us most years. This summer got a little bit too dry at times and things stopped, but that's not much of a problem. And I really attribute it a lot to the, to the mulching. Either way, I can recall a summer where it didn't really rain and my mother had a well mulched garden on a totally exposed hill and she did really fine. We found like with this witchet type path we have here, when it's really, really dry, you stick your finger in a centimeter and it's not dry, it's nice and moist. So really it's the mulching and perhaps the surrounding circumstances. It is also a, a soil with a lot of clay in it as opposed to sand. So that's mainly what we do. We do water a little bit sometimes, but it's really not at all a major factor here. It, it should be, I'm gonna say, mainly we water when we transplant. You know, we put little like seedlings out then we water for a couple of days or so. Um, but but that's, really, that's really it for, uh, the watering. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we're very fortunate that way. Oh yeah, I did remember it should be added or, you know, raised beds are really popular for a lot of people uh, with the kind of idea that, you know, instead of digging down, if you just like raise it up, you kind of cut the labor of digging down. Now I understand that some people have a hard time like bending down and working that close to the ground, but if, we also make it drier. Anything that is, of course, above ground, won't, the, the plants won't be able to kind of dig into the water that is naturally in the soil. So anything, any raised bed will require more watering. Yes, great tips um, on both of those. Oh, and yes. Yeah, thank you. I was going to say, do you want to put up your slide with the... <laughs> website and email address here um, for folks to jot down if they want to um, get in touch or ask a question or look at some more pictures of your beautiful home. Um, and maybe while folks write that down, and I can also send a follow-up email out to everybody with that information. Um, and that way you'll have it in your inboxes too. But maybe while folks jot that down, we had one more question come in, which was if you had any tips on putting your garden to bed for this season as, as our growing season um, winds down here in Maine. It, it's a really good general practice to mulch your gardens for the winter. Um, as in the summer, even in the winter, any exposed soil will take a beating, deteriorating is a strong word, but it will take a beating 
uh, the sun and the wind, uh, it's really drying or it, you know, it just kind of eats a lot of nutrients away from the soil. So find something to cover it up with. Uh, if you have straw or anything like that, it will work great. And it's easy enough to rake up in the spring and put in your compost pile. Uh, you can add compost now or later if you have a source of uh, animal manure. You can put that on before you mulch and kind of save yourself a little bit of labor in the spring instead. We've, we've often mulched um, in the fall with seaweed and we have always been amazed that by the time the ground thawed, the worms stepped into the ground, we never mix it in. It's just gone. And uh, that may have a lot to do with what seaweed is like. It kind of turns to liquid, but the uh, worms and sand fleas that come in it just devour it and incorporate it. So that's, that's handy. Wonderful. Thank you. And some thank yous in the chat here for um, this nice, inspiring talk. Thanks for taking the time to show us around from a distance. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. We hope you enjoyed spending your evening with us here. We're glad to have you. Um, stay in touch with the websites there or um, join us for another event soon. We hope to see you again. Come on down and meet us. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Nice to have you. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Annalie. Thank you, Dennis, for the great talk and tour. Dennis, Thank we you, were, so Dennis, we, we came down there to visit. Well, we came up there because we're from Naples, Florida. Um, and we stayed with you probably in 2014. And uh, it was an awesome time and we're still farming this. We're in our 15th year um, at our present location. So thank you for all you're doing for, for the plants and for the community and for opening up the hostel. Thank you. Thanks so much. We hope to see you again. After COVID-19. Yes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.